Well, I, I think it's a pleasure to be uh, talking to you in this beautiful lecture theatre. I think it is the, one of the nicest lecture theatres I've ever spoken in. It obviously shows that the engineers are much richer than physicists. <laughs> so um, so this, this, the topic is back to the Big Bang, Large Hadron Collider. Uh, I'm, good, I'm going to try to explain to you how we get back to the Big Bang, and Tara will explain to you what we expect to find when we get there. Of course, the... Uh, <clears throat> If you were not on another planet in the last year, you, you must have heard about the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, which is a giant particle accelerator uh, on the outskirts of Geneva. And this is an outline of it. If, uh, you can actually see nothing from the air, but uh, the uh, LHC itself is in a tunnel 27 kilometers in circumference, um, uh, roughly 100 meters deep. Uh, and it is fed. This, this is the CERN site itself. And over the years, the CERN accelerators, uh, this is the original one, it's, nearly, it's more than 50 years old. Uh, and this is the one that I cut my teeth on in the early 70s. The super proton synchrotron are all part of the injector chain now for the LHC. You can see the, at the airport runway of Geneva, a bit of the lake and, and the city is, is very close, just here. So before I start, uh, just a word of introduction about CERN. Uh, CERN was founded in, in 1954, only nine years after the, uh, after the war, uh, and of course the purposes were to, to reunite scientific Europe, uh, at least in, in, in frontline physics, uh, and also to provide facilities by pooling resources, facilities that no single nation could, um, could afford. It was, it was cited in Geneva because uh, Geneva was neutral and it was cheap, and it's still neutral. So I, I think that now uh, CERN has, has grown to be the, the premier laboratory in the world. Uh, this is a map showing the, the users of CERN. So the people who come to CERN to do their experiments. Of course, we've got the CERN member states in blue. Uh, now 20 member states. Uh, and, and there are more in... in, in, in uh, <laughs> There are more put in application to join. And uh, then you see, basically, apart from this huge hole, which is Africa, you see the whole world. Um, the ones in green have got the special status of observers, uh, and the ones in red are users. Uh, and there is a whole United Nations there. And I, I think it is incredible how it works. OK, now. What, what are we doing? I mean, what is the fundamental um, problem? So basically, I, it's, it's Einstein's equation. I think you know the equivalence of mass and energy. Mass and energy are interchange, interchangeable. E equals mc squared. If you want to make a heavy object, you need a lot of energy. Now, looking at the scales of uh, of energy the, or mass, and we, we will be talking in the same way. We, we're never talking grams, we're talking electron volts when, when, when we're talking about the mass of something, or more like giga electron volts. Uh, one electron volt is, is, is tiny uh, weight, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 36 kilograms. You know that heat is a form of energy as well. Uh, an electron volt is just accelerating ele elect an electron through one volt of potential. Now, if you wanted to get that one electron volt by, heat, by heating, by using heat, then one electron volt is equivalent to 11,600 degrees centigrade. So now you can see where, where we are, are, si are situated in, in the scale of, of voltage. Um, I think cook, cooking, for instance, an oven, gas mark five, something like 200 degrees centigrade, you are breaking molecular bonds. So you're using millivolts. We are, are in the millivolt to the volt regime, whereas at CERN, we are interested in the tera electron volt regime. And that's equivalent to ten, the phenomenal temperature of 10 to the 16 degrees centigrade. Where would you find such temperatures? The temperature in the center of the sun is, is about 5 million degrees. Uh, 10 to the 16 degrees only happened at the very beginning of our universe. I think now that is there is overwhelming evidence that our universe 
started as a singularity called the Big Bang uh, and expanded and cooled as a function of time. And this is a, a cartoon on a very nonlinear scale of the expansion of the universe uh, in, in years. We know that the uh, universe is now 13.7 billion years old from the Big Bang. Pretty accurately, we are sitting here. Uh, and we know that the temperature, at least the temperature of the outer space, is 3 degrees Kelvin. A little bit less. But certainly warmer than the LHC is, I can tell you. Now, um, going back in time towards the beginning of the universe, I think you can, do, you can go back in time in various ways. Uh, one way is with astronomical telescopes. And with the beautiful uh, results coming out of the Hubble, for instance, you can go back to see the formation of the very young galaxy formation, which is about a, a billion years ago, 1,000 million years ago. This is as far back as we can go in time by visual observation of the galaxies. We can go back further than that by uh, in, in uh, measuring the, the, what's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. Up until about 400,000 years, around here, the universe was so hot that it was, it was a plasma, and a plasma uh, traps light. You can't see the center of the sun because the light is trapped by it. And at about 400,000 years, then the temperature got low enough that the electrons and the protons in the plasma combined to form hydrogen atoms, and the universe became transparent, and it let the light out. That light has been traveling uh, in the expanding universe. It was, it was very high energy initially, but the expansion of the universe has ex expanded its wavelength until you now find it in the microwave regime. And the cosmic microwave background is a measurement of the microwave spectrum all, all over the universe. Um, and that takes us back about 400,000 years, and it's getting a, a lot of new information. And there, there was a rocket launch uh, a few days ago with, with the, I think it's the Planck uh, satellite, to make a very fine measurement of the, the, the cosmic microwave background. So that takes us uh, to here. To really get back to the origin, of course, we've got to get these temperatures of 10 to the 16 degrees, or the tera electron volt, which we can do in our accelerators. And that bring, takes us back to about a trillionth of a second after the start of the Big Bang. And that is the regime that we are investigating with the LHC. Uh, I will say no more about that. Tara will tell you what we expect to find. OK, so our tool to, uh, to, to, to do this, our time machine, is a particle ac accelerator. I think that uh, progress has always been made in understanding the uh, nature of matter by accelerating particles. Rutherford uh, discovered the atomic nucleus by bombarding a thin foil with alpha particles, which are made from natural from radioactive decay. But of course, to get up to a higher energy, then we have to do it by artificial means. Um, and we use particle accelerators, but very special ones. And just to explain you in, in, in very simply how a particle accelerator works, uh, or at least how a synchrotron works, there, 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 are, there are different kinds, but we use synchrotrons, and this is a cartoon of a of, of particle accelerator. Uh, first of all, the particles got to be charged because you have to be able to bend them, steer them in a magnetic field. So the uh, projectiles that we use are normally either electrons or protons, the hydrogen nuclei. Although in the LSE we will also use heavy ions. So particles are injected into a ring uh, with electromagnets, which guide the, the particles around on a circular orbit. And this is a cross-section of an of, of a electromagnet where, where you see the, co the coils carrying the current. And the, uh, the magnetic field loops around the coils like this. And the field is vertical here. It's, you see it's not quite vertical because it's got to be perpendicular to the surfaces. This is because there's also some focusing put into it. But basically, these uh, guide the particles around on a circular orbit. There's got to be a vacuum chamber in here, and there's got to be a very good vacuum. Otherwise, the 
particles will be lost, of course. So ultra-high vacuum is part of our, uh, the, the, one of the fundamental things we need. Now, each time, uh, at one point on the circumference, there is a, a radio frequency station, which is, a, which is basically a, a cavity, a, tin, a, a copper can, in which uh, radio waves are transmitted and producing an oscillating electric field. And it is arranged that the revolution frequency of the particles is, is an exact subharmonic of the frequency of the field. So that every time a particle comes around, the field is in the right direction to kick, to kick it on and give more energy. Of course, if it gets more energy, then two things happen. One is that the, the field in the, in the magnets have got to be incrementally increased because they're higher energy now, they need more higher field to bend them. And the second is that the RF frequency must be changed because, at least when they're non-relativistic, then the particles come around quicker on the next time. So it's a continuous interbalance between the, the frequency of the RF and, and the, the, the bending field of the magnets. And of course, at some point, the magnets will saturate. So you cannot get any more energy out. Uh, the ion will saturate in a, in a normal electromagnet. The, the uh, field of saturation is of order 1.5 Tesla. Um, and, that's, and that's it. If you want to make a bigger machine, then you, 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 higher energy, then you would have to make a bigger and bigger ring. For the LHC, we, are, we have to make uh, 8.3 Tesla, much, much higher. And of course, that leads us into the regime of superconductivity and more. Now, um, Traditionally, I, I said, uh, the Rutherford uh, discovered the atomic nucleus by bombarding um, uh, a, a, a target with alpha particles. And up until about the 70s, we used to do, with our particle accelerators, the same kind of experiment. The machine would be a one-ring machine where you would accelerate the particles, and then when, the, when you got up to the energy where the magnets saturated, you'd kick them out onto a, a target and produce other particles, converting energy into mass, uh, and studying the decay products. Doing it like this is extremely inefficient kinematically because uh, what matters is not the energy of the beam, it's the energy in the center of mass system. And uh, when, a, uh, when a, a, a high energy particle hits a stationary target, then a lot of energy is used in pushing on the, 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 the target uh, uh, nucleus. And in fact, uh, the energy available in a machine like this is only proportional to the square root of the beam energy. So it's extremely inefficient that, uh, to, to get up to very high energy, you, you quickly run out of steam. Uh, and it is for that reason that we had to develop in the, in the 70s a new technology where we ha actually have two rings with the two beams in opposite direction and colliding one on the other. And you can imagine it, you know, two cars colliding head-on is much more damage than a car colliding with a stationary one. Um, so in that case, of, of course, the, the whole of the energy of the beam is available in the center of mass, and therefore you can create uh, much, much higher temperatures and new particles. And this is a picture of the first of these devices, which was built at CERN in the late 60s. It was, it was called the intersecting storage rings. It, it is obsolete now. But you can see very well the principle. You can see the ring of electromagnets, two rings of electromagnets, crossing each other at an angle. Uh, and at this point, there would be an experiment. Now, a very simple experiment in those days. Uh, Tara will show you what it means, an experiment these days. But, you know, this would be a very small thing around the collision point. So this was a pioneering device. It wasn't very high energy, but it... it, it, it was the first step in developing the technology of having colliding beam storage rings, which is what the LHC is. So this is the, the picture of the, of the LHC. You don't see very much because uh, these blue things are bending magnets, but not just bending magnets for one ring, but for two. Uh, this is a cross-section cross of what's inside. So what we have here, are th these are superconducting coils built from superconducting cable with the, with the, elect the, um, the current flowing into the board 
in one coil and out of the board in the other, and they're producing a vertical magnetic field which bends the magnets, bends the particles in, a, in an orbit. And here is the other aperture, the other machine effectively, uh, where the, the, the uh, magnetic field is in the opposite direction, so protons going in one direction and the opposite direction are, are, are bent on the same orbit. These are in a, 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 a structure. When these coils are energized, then the uh, Electromagnetic force, which, which is trying to push the coils apart, is about 100, 500 tons per meter, one jumbo jet per meter that we've got to hold in the structure uh, when the thing is energized. It is su surrounded by a, 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 a yoke which carries a magnetic flux, and the whole thing is cooled down to 1.9 degrees Kelvin. So that is, you know, uh, zero degrees Kelvin is minus 273 degrees centigrade, the absolute zero of temperature. This machine is co cooled to only 1.9 degrees from the absolute zero temperature. Now, not only that, but something very special happens to the fluid, which is liquid helium, used to cool them to those temperatures, and I will mention that in a moment. So th th there are two pillars on which the, uh, the, the LHC design rests. The first is the is superconductivity. Now, there, there is a very interesting story and a big scientific mystery to me, because uh, the first time that helium was liquefied was in 1908 in, uh, in Leiden by uh, Hank Kamelingones, who was in a race with Sir Humphrey Davy to, to uh, achieve the last gas to be liquefied. That was in 1908. Uh, in 1911, then he used that, li that liquid. Helium, liquid helium is, is uh, boiling liquid at 4.2 degrees Kelvin. He had the means of reducing the temperature even further, and we know that he went down to 1.5 Kelvin many times. And he used that, that liquid to investigate the properties of materials and he was prima primarily interested in the properties of material. He, he discovered the first superconductor, which was actually mercury, uh, in 1911. And then, of course, the field of superconductivity uh, grew. I think the, 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 there have been many superconductors discovered since, uh, and it is a superconductor that we are using to build the magnets of the LHC. The superconductors for the LHC are extremely um, sophisticated, and they've taken a huge uh, amount of effort to produce. This is a picture of, a, this is called a Rutherford braid. Uh, the technology was developed in the, in the Rutherford lab uh, in, in the, in the uh, 1960s. Uh, and unfortunate, un, uh, unfortunately, it was, was abandoned in, in UK industry. So I think uh, we've had uh, this superconductor manufactured all over the world in U.S., in Japan, in Germany, in Italy, in Finland, and in France. But the origin of it was in the U.K., and there is no manufacturing base. So you, you see here, the, this, is, this is the basic building block, the superconducting cable, which looks like there are 32 strands of, of wire. It looks like an ordinary copper wire until you etch away the copper. And then when you etch, the, etch away the copper, you find... There are 9,000 filaments of niobium titanium, 6 micron uh, in diameter, and this is uh, electrograph where you can see the, these filaments, which are the real current carrying objects. They carry 12 kiloamps. Uh, and, and the cross section of this cable, which is keystone, as you see, because we've got to make this kind of arch uh, of, a, of a coil, we've got to wind it into a coil. So that's the first thing. We need superconductivity. But uh, no superconductor can produce the... Uh, and the normal way you would use it is to, is to cool it in liquid helium. And, that, and, uh, and now even, even uh, MRI scanners, they operate, by the way, at about one tesla for you to normalize the field. They operate about one tesla in normal liquid helium. We have to get up to eight, nearly eight and a half tesla. Um, and... To do that, we, we have to use another trick. Uh, we have to cool the helium down uh, 
uh, from 4.5 Kelvin to 1.9 Kelvin. And the way you do, do that normally, I mean, uh, you all know that you, you, your tea tastes less good on the top of a high mountain than it does at sea level because the atmosp lower atmospheric pressure makes the, wa the water boil at a lower temperature. So the way that you cool down liquids uh, is to reduce the, the, pr the pressure, of pump, basically pump on them, and the temperature will go down. Now, this is where the great scientific mystery is, I tell you, because Kamerling did this countless times. What happens when you, when you do that? Uh, so normal boiling helium is at uh, 100 kilopascal atmospheric pressure at 4.2 Kelvin. And then as you pump in it, then the, 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 uh, as you reduce the pressure, you reduce the temperature. Uh, and at 50 millibar pressure, something very dramatic happens. The liquid becomes a superfluid. It becomes a macroscopic quantum state. It is quantum mechanics before your very eyes. And this is, this is the, the real mystery to me, because it, it, is, it is visually absolutely striking, this transition through the lambda point. It's called the lambda point, 2.17 degrees uh, uh, Kelvin and 50 millibar pressure. You go through this point where there is a phase transition in, in, in the helium. Now, this is a second order phase transition. That means there's no latent heat involved. So it, it is harder to spot, if you like, normally. But visually, it's not hard to spot at all. This is a picture uh, of, it, it's not very clear, but, th but this is a glass tube containing liquid helium above the lambda point at 2.4 Kelvin. And what you can see here is the liquid boiling like mud. So it's boiling, bubbling away like mud. And precisely at the lambda point, 2.17 Kelvin, the, the boiling just stops. It's like seeing water change to ice before your eyes. And of course, the, the, the mystery is, this was discovered in 1930, 1938, 30 years after the discovery of liquid helium, when certainly Cumberling took it through the lambda point, never realized that, that well, he did realize that there was something, there was something funny going on. In his, he, got, he got the Nobel Prize in 1913. Uh, and in his Nobel lecture, uh, he, he, he didn't say anything about the boiling, but uh, he, 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 he it's very notable that the experiment indicates there's a density of the helium, which uh, th there is a discontinuity in the density of the helium. Uh, and one thing is quite fascinating to me is that it, such an extreme could possibly be connected with the quantum theory. Now, the quantum theory, it was 1900 at Max Planck, and 1913 when the Bohr atom, uh, Niels Bohr, uh, made the first very simple quantum theory. So it was extremely young. So he took a shot in the dark there. He was right. But he totally ignored it afterwards. Didn't, didn't go, look, he was so interested in finding new superconductors, he never paid any attention to the liquid that he was use, using for cooling it. And um, it was in 1938, uh, I think I put it on the, uh, on the yeah. Uh, in 1938, super, superfluidity, this new state of helium, was, uh, was discovered and published uh, in, in Nature, two, in two papers side by side, by Peter Kapitza in, in Moscow and by Alan and Missner, in, uh, two Canadian physicists, in fact, who had, uh, were working in Cambridge. So 1938, 1908 was the liquefaction and the transition through the lambda point, and 1938 discovered it was a macroscopic quantum state. And even uh, in, 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 in 1988, Jack Allen is now dead. But he said, in my PhD work in Toronto on superconductivity, which is what everybody was interested in, I had often seen the sudden cessation of boiling at the lambda temperature, but it paid no, it no particular attention. It never occurred to me that it was of fundamental significance. So just to finish with that story, I think that uh, there was a simultaneous discovery, uh, and, and by a total injustice, it's only Kapitza got the Nobel Prize. Um, and that is another mystery, which... Uh, we can probably delve into the Nobel in the in the, uh, the Nobel archives by now to find out why. Okay, so the, so the LHC has to work in the, in this remarkable superfluid helium. It's a remarkable engineering material. I don't have time to to go into too much detail now, but some of its characteristics are a complete lack of viscosity. 
So it, it, it goes through the finest capillary, so it's a welder's nightmare. Um, it's got an enormous thermal conductivity. It's, the, it's by far the highest thermal conductivity of, of any material known to, to man. But it's a quantum liquid, and nothing is simple with a quantum liquid. And it, in fact, its thermal conductivity is a function of the heat flux density that it's transporting. It's great at transporting a low heat flux density, but when that gets up, then the thermal conductivity collapses. And you've heard about some of the problems we've had um, with a, a, a bad joint in the LHC, which has given us a lot of problems. Uh, and that was the reason uh, that there was a heating that, that we didn't see. And once the, uh, the, the heat dissipation got above a certain threshold, then the helium collapses. It's no longer a good conductor. So for the LHC, we have to take the, 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 the uh, helium below the lambda point. In fact, we have to go down to, this is 2.17 Kelvin. We have to go down to 1.9 Kelvin. So we have to pump to 15 millibar pressure. So how, how do we do that? Uh, this is a cartoon of, of, of the LHC magnets, those blue things that you saw. Uh, and they're, they're all connected in series, electrically. You don't see the coil in this cartoon, but you see the buzz bar connecting from one magnet to the other. And what you see here is the, uh, the limited tra transverse, it's in a pipe basically, the, the, the buzz bar interconnect. And there are joints. Of course, there are braised joints here. And uh, this is where, where, where the problem was, that, that we had one bad joint, which was, which was not bad on, in any of your standards, 100 nanoohms of resistance, but enough to produce enough heat dissipation in this limited cross-section area to collapse the natural heat conduction in the helium column. And that's what causes the damage. So uh, how, do we, how do we actually cool the magnets? Well, you can't pump the, these huge magnets to 15 millibar. What we do actually is we have a heat exchanger tube inside the magnets, uh, which anyway, the LSE is segregated on in 106 meter sections. It just repeats itself every 106 meters. So every 106 meters, we have a heat exchanger tube, which is pumped. So this is evacuated to 15 millibar pressure. And the uh, helium is, is expanded through a Joule-Thompson valve, which reduces the temperature into this volume uh, and becomes a superfluid at 1.9 Kelvin. Uh, and then it, it trickles along this heat exchanger. And the magnets themselves are, are, are filled with normal helium. But through latent heat of evaporation, then the helium inside the magnets cools, crosses the lambda point. So we end up in a state inside the magnets of uh, helium at superfluid at atmospheric pressure. You, you cannot do it any other way. Uh, helium, is an, uh, helium gas is an extremely bad conductor of electricity. The, break the breakdown potential is very low. You cannot have ele any electrical circuits inside helium gas. So this is the way we separate the two functions of the superfluid, which necessarily is in gas, and the helium in the magnets, which is uh, at atmospheric pressure. And this is a picture now of uh, uh, two LEC magnets being welded up. Uh, the beam pipe, this is the beam pipe uh, in, in which the beam will circle, one of the two beams will circle it. You can't see the other one, it's behind it. This is the heat, heat exchanger tube uh, where, we, where we pump some atmospheric pressure. Uh, and, and this actually is one of the buzz bar tubes, which, uh, which is one, one that failed, as I explained, because of the limited cross-sectional area for evacuating the heat flux. So it's been a monumental job uh, building the LHC. It's, it's taken nearly 15 years. Uh, the LHC contains, th these are the bending magnets for LHC, but it contains many more than that. 1,232 of these objects, which uh, had to be, of course, first we had to manufacture the superconducting cable uh, and then supply that to the assemblers of, of, of the magnets themselves. Uh, we worked it w with many uh, European industries. Uh, in, these were actually manufactured in three places, in, in uh, Italy, Germany, and, uh, and France. Uh, this is a picture of our, our test stand because every single one of them has to be tested at 1.9 Kelvin. So it has to be put on a test stand, it has to be cooled down uh, and powered up to uh, the, the 8.3 uh, Kelvin 
8.3 Tesla nominal field. So this installation here was running 24 hours a day, seven days a week for four years with only a two-week shutdown for maintenance. I mean, we've never pushed anything so hard in CERN ever than, than this thing in order to get the, everything through in time. Then uh, we, we have to install the machine. So these things are 15 meters in diameter. The, ton, the machine is roughly 100 meters deep. Uh, and we have actually one shaft, which is a big uh, elliptical shaft, which is wide enough to put the magnets down. And then they have to be transported underground uh, at three kilometers an hour, 15 kilometers in, in, the, in the worst case, which, um, which was a terrible job, obviously, uh, under very restricted conditions. Here you see the transport of a magnet past a ready installed machine. And this uh, took two years to, uh, to uh, finish the installation of the machine. Uh, of course, it's very good that we did it for the local population that we did it like that because if we carry these things on the roads, then the whole of the Geneva region would be blocked up. Um, so this is a picture of, of then when, when these, um, the transport vehicles get to the, to the final point, they have to be transferred on special transfer tables. They weigh 35 tons each. Uh, and they have to be transferred in this very restrictive space onto the jacks and aligned to a tenth of a millimeter. You saw the, uh, already a picture of, of an interconnect being closed by the welders. And as I say, the, the constraints on this welding with superfluid are much, more, much worse than normal. Uh, the electrical connections of, of these magnets have to be, so these are, two superconducting cables here, uh, which are uh, brazed. Basically, they are, they're brazed together with two tons of pressure and then induction brazed uh, to give a good joint. But there was one that was bad, and we didn't find it. There are 50,000 in the machine, so it's not surprising that we have one bad one. Um, but the consequence was quite, was, was quite bad. And the, the, the actual, the, these are small superconducting cables, which are for little corrector magnets. And they are, they are uh, welded with ultra, ultrasonic welding. Uh, electrical quality assurance. Unfortunately, you cannot find 100 nanohomes in a, in, in a, at, at warm in an in environment like the, uh, the, the tunnel, which is noisy. But even 100 nanohomes, you've got to go super connect, connecting before you can see it. So even though we did a lot of electrical quality assurance, um, it, we, it didn't find that, that bad joint. Now we, now we have ways that we, we can spot anything. The project has been, well, uh, as far as the LC machine is concerned, the machine itself normally is the responsibility of the host lab, the responsibility of CERN to build. And then the detectors, as Tara will explain to you, uh, from huge international collaborations, coming in, bringing in pieces. It's amazing that it works, but it does. Uh, for the LHC, it was a bit different. This time for the LHC, there was also a contribution from outside of the member states. They had to pay uh, the, their part in helping us to build the machine. And uh, we had uh, contributions from Canada, um, uh, from India. These, many things, but these, these are small superconducting magnets built in, in India. Uh, from Japan, these are the turbines of the coal compressors because the, the actual produce, production of the superfluid helium, the pumping on the helium gas is a, a very sophisticated machines. They're multi-stage compressors uh, which, which are bringing the, uh, the gas from 1.9, uh, from, from 15 millibar up to atmospheric pressure. And these are the uh, this, the rotating turbines, 50,000 RPM, which, which go into these compressors. From the United States, I think there, there have been some very special, uh, uh, the, these are insertion magnets. And I always tell people that they shouldn't sit on magnets. But uh, I, I disobeyed the rule myself here for this picture, coming from Russia. So it has been a, a absolutely, uh, it's been an enormous project. And I think that we, we had a setback, which we are, now recovering from, we will be up and running again 
in a few months from now. Uh, and this time, uh, we will make sure that nothing uh, like that can happen again. So that is not only the LHC machine. Uh, this is a, a cartoon of, of, of the machine, uh, roughly 100 meters underground. And there are four uh, detectors which have to be located at the points where the beams collide. Uh, these have needed some, also some pretty uh, big engineering. Um, the two, two of the detectors had to be ex excavated in completely new caverns. This one, Atlas, is the, the biggest cavern that's ever been ex excavated in, in that kind of rock. Uh, this one, CMS, the compact muon spectrometer, was an absolute nightmare because there was a, an underground river flowing in this region uh, at about 40 meters deep, which we knew about, and we had foreseen to, uh, of course, sinking the shafts was a problem there. We, we, we were warned, uh, and we had foreseen to uh, sink the shaft through an ice wall, but the flow rate of the river was much, much, and the ice wall was to, was, was to be made with brine, uh, we just could not seal it at all with brine, and in the end, we had to use liquid nitrogen to, 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 to freeze a, a large area and then excavate inside. So both of these were big challenges as far as civil engineering is concerned. Then there are two smaller experiments, LHCB, of which Tara is a member, uh, and Alice, which are, are small enough to be, uh, to be put into the, some of the infrastructure. Because this tunnel, I didn't say in the beginning, this tunnel that we we recuperated from a, a previous machine and some of the infrastructure as well, these two caverns, for instance. So I, I think that is the LHC machine, a very, a very brief uh, presentation of the LHC machine. Now I think Tara will take you on and explain to you the, the detectors and the physics that is going to come out of LHC. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, uh, there will be time for questions at the end, so if you do have any questions for Lynn, can you just um, hold on to them for now? I'll just uh, introduce uh, Dr. Tara Shears to give the second part of tonight's presentation. Thank you. Thank you all very much. So I'm going to give part two of this lecture where I'm going to talk about why we've built the LHC, now that you've heard all about it and you have a good idea of what it is. And to do this demands that I tell you a little bit about particle physics, because that's the background to building this amazing machine. So I want to give you a brief introduction to particle physics, what it is, what we're trying to study. And then I want to tell you what we know about the universe so far. And then importantly, what we don't know about the universe. And I'm going to tell you about three of the biggest outstanding questions in our subject today, because it's searching for answers to these questions that have motivated us to build the Large Hadron Collider. And then, having told you about what we don't know, I'm going to tell you about how we try and find answers and how we plan to use this accelerator to try and push back the frontiers of our knowledge once we get some data. Now, one thing I hope you notice from our two presentations is that it takes a large number of people with a huge variety of expertise to make a project like the Large Hadron Collider work. So I am actually a, an experimental particle physicist, so this part of the talk is given from a physicist's point of view. And I was asked to say a few words very briefly about my career, just to say how I got here and how I was involved in the project. Well, I was always, always very interested when I was young, in the very large things like stars and galaxies and black holes, as well as very, very small things. And that led me to take a physics degree starting in 1988. And in the course of that, I realized I was really much more interested in the small things. So I took a PhD in particle physics. And that was based out at CERN in the precursor to the Large Hadron Collider that Lynn referred to just now. And I took a couple of fellowships out there on the experiment. Um, until 2000 when I had another fellowship at the main competition to CERN out in America. And now, about one and a half years ago, I got a permanent academic job in the University of Liverpool. So that's how I 
been able to stay on in the subject. But somewhat ironically, given the length of time I've now spent in the subject, is that I've realized that particle physics isn't only about the very small things. It's also about the very large things, believe it or not, because particle physics is all about trying to understand the universe, and you can't get much bigger than that. It's just that the approach that we take is to study the universe from the bottom up. We try and study the universe by looking at the behavior of the smallest constituents inside it. And once we've understood what those are and how they behave, then we have a picture for what knits it all together, and that helps explain why it looks the way it does to us. Now, you've already seen a version of this picture. Lynn had a much nicer version that he showed you in his talk. But the point I want to make is that we already know quite a lot about the universe. Lynn's told you that we think everything started in the Big Bang. Then everything rapidly expanded. The early universe was tremendously dense, very hot, very energetic, looked very different to the universe we know now. In fact, you don't see stars and galaxies at all in the very early universe. You don't even see atoms. You just see the ingredients of atoms, very small constituents of matter that we call fundamental particles. This is what the universe was made up of in the very early times. As time marches on, everything cools down, slows down, gets bigger, much like us. And after a few hundred thousand years, we get atoms. And after a few billion years, here we are today to talk about it. And we know this because, as Lynn said, we can look at this part of the universe directly through telescopes. But if we really, really want to understand the universe, we also have to understand how it evolved. And that demands understanding what went on at very early times, too. And this is where particle physics plays its part. This is where the particle accelerators that we build play their part because it's inside the particle accelerators that we can recreate the very energetic conditions that were last seen in the universe at very early times. And this allows us to study what the universe was made of at that time. So what do we understand so far? Well, quite a lot, although it might not look like it from this picture. So we found out that everything that we've seen in our experiments can be decomposed into 12 basic building blocks of matter. Six of a type we call quarks, six of a type we call leptons. Now, these really are the ingredients of atoms. These fundamental particles are at least as small compared to atoms as atoms are compared to us. And I say at least as small because they're so small that we've never been able to measure them. And this is just the limit of our experimental measurements. Now, what makes the universe look the way it does to us is the fact that these constituents are knitted together inside matter and held together by a small number of fundamental forces. So there's the weak force, for example, which acts on all of these. The weak force is responsible for radioactive decay. There's the electromagnetic force, very familiar to us. It's powering the projector and the laptop and all sorts of useful things. This also acts on any of our fundamental particles that have an electric charge. And in addition, there's something called the strong force, which only acts on these quarks. And it's a strong force that keeps atomic nuclei together, stops positively charged protons from breaking it apart. And that's basically it for particle physics. Now, unfortunately, it's not the whole story, because we know there's at least one other very important fundamental force that I haven't mentioned, and that's gravity, of course. Gravity is responsible for the large-scale structure of the universe. But at the very tiny scales we look at in particle physics, gravity is so much weaker than the other forces that we just tend to ignore it. So we only deal with the three forces that I've mentioned. Now, we even have a picture as well for how these forces stick matter together. And we think a force is conferred by means of a force-carrying particle, and I've got an example here, that's exchanged between our matter particles. So if we look at all the particles we've identified in particle physics, then the whole collection is just as simple as this. Matter particles and a small number of force-carrying particles. And the universe is nothing more than a recipe made up of these very small number of fundamental ingredients. And not only do we have a picture for how it all works out, but we also have a theory that encapsulates this mathematically. And we can use this theory to predict what we see in our experiments. And this theory is really, really good. This theory is so good that we haven't yet made an experimental measurement that disagrees with any of its predictions. This theory is so good that, hubristically, we've called it the standard model of particle physics. Well, that sounds great, doesn't it? And in fact, 
if that's all there were to it, we wouldn't be doing research anymore because we would have come to the limit of our knowledge. But unfortunately, good though our theory is at predicting what we see in our experiments, it doesn't actually explain very much at all. There are some huge questions in our understanding of the universe that we're searching for answers for that really drive us on to perform research. So now having told you the good optimistic side of particle physics, I want to move on to the flip side. And I'm going to give you three examples, yes, three, <laughs> three examples of the sort of things that keep you up at night if you're a particle physicist. And I'm not lying about this, we really do wake up at 3 a.m. wondering about our subject. So the first problem concerns something very simple and very fundamental, and that's mass. Now, we all have mass. We know this. We, we can see it. We can see its effects every time we step on a pair of weighing scales. And our fundamental particles have mass, too. And we know this because we can measure it in our experiments. But what we don't know is what mechanism causes them to have mass or why they should have the particular values of mass that they do. And I've tried to allude to the different masses of these particles by the different sized blobs next to them. This is a sort of artistic impression. And even more than that, we don't understand why the mass of one of these particles, the top quark, is so much bigger than all the others. A top quark has the same mass as an atom of gold, and yet it's at least a thousand million times smaller, and we don't know why. However, we do have a theory that tries to explain why. And this isn't a new theory. It was first put forward in the 1960s by many people, amongst whom was a man called Peter Higgs. And this theory tries to explain mass as a property that matter, stuff, gets by its interaction with a new type of particle that's present throughout the universe. And this particle, very unimaginatively, is called the Higgs particle. Now, I just want to say a word here. Sometimes this particle is known as the God particle, thanks to the title of a book written in the 1990s by Nobel Prize winner Leon Lederman. It doesn't have any deep significance. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a misnomer, this name. So whenever you see the God particle in any articles or in any films, then substitute the Higgs particle in your mind. So this theory describes mass as a property matter gets by its interaction with this Higgs particle. And the amount of mass a particle gets just depends on how strong that interaction is. And this theory is actually an integral part of our standard model of particle physics. And as such, it's played its part in every successful prediction that's been verified by experiment. But it's only a theory. And it's only a theory because we've never managed to prove it's one experimental prediction. We've never seen a Higgs particle in any of our experiments, despite man years of effort invested in looking for it. And this is a real problem, because if we don't find a Higgs particle, we can't be sure that it exists. And if it doesn't exist, then our theory that describes mass is just wrong. And at that stage, life becomes very serious if you're a particle physicist, because if this theory is wrong, then our whole theoretical framework that we use to understand the universe is also wrong. And we really would have the wrong end of the stick in that case, and we'd have to think again. So that's why the search for this Higgs particle is of such fundamental importance to us as physicists. It's very important to help us validate or negate our understanding of the entire universe. However, it's not the only problem. Here's another one. Antimatter. Antimatter is really bizarre. It's like a mirror version, an inverse version of normal matter. The problem is that in the Big Bang, we think that equal amounts of matter and antimatter, its partner, were made. But if we look at the universe around us now, we only see one type, which we call normal matter. And we know this because when you get matter and antimatter meeting, they annihilate, releasing enormous amounts of energy. If I have one gram of antimatter meeting one gram of normal matter, then this annihilation has the explosive force of 20,000 tons of TNT. Now, this is something that you would notice if it was going on around you. It doesn't, and it doesn't seem to go on anywhere in the universe where we've been able to look as well. Now, <laughs> we don't understand why this is. But we do think this process went on all the time in the very early universe. Matter and antimatter met, annihilated, and these annihilations were energetic enough to give us new matter-antimatter particle pairs. But in the very early universe, of course, it was expanding. And as it was expanding, it was cooling. And as it cooled, these annihilations lost more and more energy. Until eventually, 
maybe a minute or so after the Big Bang, these annihilations no longer had enough energy to produce new matter-antimatter particle pairs. And this whole cosmic battle between matter and antimatter just stopped at that point. And what remains in the universe now is a consequence of a very tiny imbalance, no more than one part in a billion, between the amount of matter and antimatter that was present at that time. If there were equal amounts, the universe now would just consist of light. We wouldn't have any stars or galaxies at all. Now, we think this is only possible if there's a very subtle difference in the behavior of matter and antimatter, but we don't know what, and we're trying to understand it because it is responsible for the evolution of the universe, and we'd like to know what it is. Problem number three is even bigger. I've told you what we understand in our experiments, but cosmologists tell us that's only 4% of the whole thing. Some 23% of the universe consists of something called dark matter, and 73%, a really whopping 73%, consists of something completely unknown called dark energy. Now, in particle physics, I have to tell you, we've got no idea what dark energy is. To be fair, we also have no idea what dark matter is either. But at least we have some theories that predict what it might be made of. And these are theories that we can test experimentally. And we can look for signatures, especially of a, a current theory called supersymmetry, in our experiments. And we do that all the time. Except I have to say, we haven't seen any evidence yet of any of these theories so far. So those are three of our biggest unknown questions. And we've built the Large Hadron Collider to look for answers to these questions. Because if we can understand all of this, then we'll have made huge amounts of headway in our understanding of the universe. So how are we going to do it? Well, remember what the LHC is. It's a machine to take us back in time. What happens when the LHC op um, starts operating again later this year is that it will circulate two beams of protons to enormous energies until they're going at only 20 kilometers an hour less than the speed of light. And as Lynn says, it will bash them into four areas where we build our experiments. What actually goes on when these proton beams collide together is that for a very tiny instant of time in a tiny area of space, we've actually recreated the conditions just after the Big Bang, these very high temperature conditions. That means we recreate the particles that existed in the universe at that time. So if we build an experiment around that collision point, we can detect these particles. We can record them. Essentially, we can take a gigantic 3D digital snapshot of what the universe looked like at that time. And if we do this thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of times, then from that series of snapshots, we can start to build up a bigger picture of what was going on in the very early universe and therefore help us understand the, the universe that little bit more. Now, Lynn told you that these experiments are also huge. I want to set the scale for you, and I'll take the Atlas experiment as my example, and Lynn's already given the game away by telling you it's the biggest one we've ever built, so I now just want to impress you with its gigantic size. So here's a picture of it on the left-hand side here. You may have seen this picture before. It was in the press quite a lot around LHC startup last year. Note the normal-sized man standing in front to give you a sense of scale. This experiment is incredibly large. It's the size of a five-story building. It's the size of a cathedral, and yet it's 100 meters underground. It's absolutely immense. And it's not just immense in size. There are some 2,000 particle physicists from all over the world that work together on this experiment. And strange as it may sound, you need this many people to work together to design and build and construct an experiment like this because it's so large, it's so complicated, and it's so costly but also to analyze its data. Now, this is quite an early picture of Atlas, and it was taken during construction. So what you can see here is essentially the magnetic skeleton of the detector. There's a hole here where one beam pipe will come in, and you're looking at the direction of the other proton beam. The collision will go on right in the center here. If you look at Atlas now, this whole volume has been filled with layers of precision particle detectors. And the way we organize all of our LHC experiments is really along the same lines. It's, our particle detectors are like onions. Each layer has a different job to do. So, for example, if I look at the particle detectors immediately around the collision point, these are very small, and their job is to track the paths of particles when they've just been produced, and they fly out with enormous energy. So here's an example 
of one of these particle detectors. This is actually for my experiment, LHCB, and it was designed and built with the University of Liverpool. So I'm being somewhat biased and showing this as an example to you. This is a silicon-based detector. So silicon is the active part. It's a silver semicircle. That would fit into the palm of your hand. And what's remarkable about this particular device is it can tell the position of anything charged going through it to within a tenth of the thickness of your hair. That's remarkable precision. Inside our experiments, we have layers of such devices. So when a particle travels through them, we have a series of dots that we can then just join after the fact using computer algorithms. This allows us to trace the path that everything takes throughout our experiments. Following layers of this type of experiment, um, sorry, this type of detector, we have other layers that identify particle type, measure energies, and then finally we come to the outside of the experiment where we have the largest detectors of all. And we call them muon chambers because the only type of particle that survives out to these large distances is a very weakly interacting particle called a muon. So here's a picture of the muon chambers at the Atlas detector. Here are two physicists who are busy cabling up the last bit. Note that they're standing on a platform which is suspended some 20 meters above the cavern's surface. This is a hallmark of an experiment like Atlas. To work on it, you need a good head for heights. And note here that this whole volume that you saw before when it was empty has now been filled completely with precision devices. So that is our experimental equipment that we're going to use in particle physics research. So just to recap, it's the LHC that recreates the early universe, and it's our experiments which act as gigantic cameras to capture the moment. And then if we can record this information, then we can apply algorithms to reconstruct what happens. And if we compare this to theoretical predictions, then we can determine if what we're seeing fits with our understanding of the universe, or better still, does not. And we might be on the road to a discovery. So let me give you, in the final part of my talk, just a very quick example of how we're going to use this um, great apparatus to try and make a discovery. And I'm going to go back to the first problem I told you about, which is the problem of mass and the Higgs. Now, we have a theory that describes the Higgs, and that means we can simulate what we expect its effects to be were it to be produced inside our experiments. And this is a picture of a proton-proton collision inside an experiment where a Higgs, believe it or not, has been produced. And what's happened is that as soon as this Higgs particle has been produced, it's decayed to four muons, which are shown as these green lines in the bottom picture. Now, this is just, the bottom picture is just a subset of the top picture, where absolutely everything that goes on when you collide two protons together has been shown. Now, it's actually pretty easy for us in pattern recognition terms to identify this signature in this mess. And if our theories are correct, then we'd expect a Higgs particle to be produced once every hour or two at the LHC, which sounds great. It sounds like we'll be able to make discoveries almost within the first day of turning on. Oh, if only it were that simple. The problem is that we're looking for something that's produced once every hour or two amongst the other collisions that are going on 40 million times a second when the LHC is, is um, running. So it's a huge selectivity problem to try and look for this new particle and make our discovery and verify our theory. We really have to, the amount of data sifting that we have to do is equivalent to looking for one person in a thousand world populations or a needle in 20 million haystacks if you want to be quite unscientific about it. We really do have to look through a huge amount of data because any one of these 40 million interactions a second that looks promising, we want to record. And for an experiment like Atlas, that means that you're reading out something like 100 million channels of electronic information. So the volume of data that we have to analyze is very, very large. And in fact, it's been estimated that the amount of data that the LHC will produce per year is a million times bigger than the world annual book production. It's a huge amount. It, it's hundreds of terabytes, it's petabytes, and yet this is the size of data set we really need to analyze if we're going to make a discovery. Now, we can do it provided we have enough computers, 100,000 computers. And that presents a little bit of a problem because no one's got 100,000 computers. No one country is going to give 100,000 computers to particle physicists. So instead, computer scientists at CERN have had to develop a completely new way of computing to meet this, this need. And they have done, and it's called the grid. Now, this isn't the first time that computer scientists have done this. In the 1990s, a computer scientist at CERN called Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web. 
it, and that was to allow particle physicists to share information. Well, everyone uses it now to share information. The grid is the next step up. And what the grid does is allows particle physicists to share not just information and data, but also their computing resources, their data storage facilities, their processes, their CPU farms. And think how many particle physicists there are worldwide. If they all make their computers available to the grid, connect them up, then in fact we can make a geographically distributed supercomputer that's powerful enough to meet our data processing needs. And this isn't science fiction, this is fact. The grid exists. This is a map of it in action. Everywhere you see a blob is where a particle phys physics institution has made its computers available to the grid. Everywhere where you see a line, well, that's where a particle physicist has written a bit of software and it's traveling the computer looking for data or sending back results. And we've already used the grid actually to simulate the data flows that we expect to see in our experiments once everything turns on. And it's not just us that finds the grid useful. Any computationally intensive problem makes use of the grid. And in fact, it's already been used to search for drugs to combat malaria, for example. But it really is the last piece in our toolkit for trying to understand the early universe, because it's only with the aid of the grid that we'll be able to analyze the vast amount of data that the LHC will produce for us. So on my final page, Having told you very briefly about how we plan to utilize this great piece of equipment and what answers we're trying to find, or what questions we're trying to solve, I thought I'd just finish by posing the question, what are we going to find? Maybe five years, 10 years, 20 or 30 years time, where are we going to stand in fundamental physics? Having run the LHC, what's it going to tell us? Well, of course, the answer is we don't know. And we don't know because this is pure research. We don't know because we've never looked at what we're going to see before. The LHC is going to recreate the universe at earlier times than we've ever observed it. So, of course, we have no idea what we're going to find there. We hope very much we're going to find the answers to some of the mysteries I've been telling you about, but perhaps we're just going to find more mysteries. We just don't know. All we can be confident about is that we're going to increase our knowledge about the universe and possibly we'll come up with spin-offs that are going to benefit mankind maybe 30 or 40 years into the future, but we don't know what yet. This is the joy of pure research. So that's a somewhat, well, it's, it's, it's actually an optimistic note to, believe, um, to end on, but I'm, I'm afraid it's not very conclusive. So I'm afraid you have to wait to find out what we're going to find out, and we have to wait to find out what we're going to find out as well as soon as we get first data. So as my final word, a good way for you to stay up to date and to get more information, should you be interested, is to stay tuned to the CERN homepage, because this is where we explain our physics, our experiments, our accelerators, and also the results that we get. So you can hear all about the latest news as soon as it happens. And if you're interested in getting involved in CERN at all, it's also where you'll find job opportunities and fellowship opportunities. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tara. So uh, now I'm going to open it up uh, for questions. Um, you'll find in your uh, seat uh, arm, armrests uh, a microphone, which you can use to, to ask your questions. Please use it, and it enables everyone to hear. Uh, just take it out and press the button once to switch it on, and again, switch it off. So we've also, I, I, I neglected to mention before, we've actually got some people joining us uh, live on IET.tv, so this, there will, will be some questions coming through from, uh, from David down in the corner. So he's going to keep an eye on the, uh, the uh, web chat there. So do we have any, any questions to start us off? Oh, there's a man with his hand up in the microphone ready, so you, sir, please. When two streams of particles, each traveling 99% the speed of light, collide, the speed of impact will be almost double the speed of light. Unbelievably... In a public meeting at the Dana Center, the scientists unanimously agreed the theory of, rel theory of relativity, relativity stops anything happening faster than the speed of light. It ignored my argument that the theory of relativity only applies to weightless things like light. Presumably, the Dana Center's visiting scientists expects both particles just before colliding will decelerate to exactly half the speed of light by a process similar to magnetic repulsion. Do you agree with these scientists? 
I'm scared the LAT will create a black hole. And they say, well, cosmic rays already happen. But they, uh, and we, my theory is wrong because um, the cosmic rays haven't created a black hole. But they're only going to be light, and you guys will be doing more or less double. Shall I ask that? Yes, yes please. So, <laughs> I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> so you actually have two questions there. So your first point about the speed of light and special relativity. Well, I, I'm with the scientists in the Dharma Center on this one. The theory of special relativity applies to absolutely everything, massless or massive. And what that means is, is if you have a massive proton and you're accelerating up to 99.99999% the speed of light, and it's going to meet a proton going at 99.9999% speed of light this way, they don't slow down. They keep on going at 99.999% the speed of light. But you can never make them go faster than the speed of light. That's just impossible. There's an effect in special relativity that stops that happening. And that effect essentially makes these protons behave as if they were progressively more and more massive and thus much harder to accelerate. So in practice, you could never actually reach the speed of light. Does that help with your... No, one, one, the other one's 99, that equals doubled. No, 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 because this impact isn't going anywhere. It's equal and opposite on both sides. And what happens is the energy of the proton, protons that meet each other, is by the formula that Lynn showed you, equals mc squared. For both of them, you sum the energy, or sorry, you, you sum the masses and the energies, and that's the energy that you have available on impact. It's energy. It's not a velocity. It's energy. Come and see me at the end, and I'll, and I'll write out the equations for you. We, we have another question here. Sorry, could you just say your name and, and your affiliation first, please? Uh, hi, I'm Brian Miller. Uh, I'm just an engineer. <laughs> um, I was wondering, have you ever collided antimatter and matter to increase the energy yields on impact? I'm sorry, I didn't... I didn't uh... Have we ever collided uh, antimatter? Because obviously an uh, antiproton anti will be with negative with matter, charge. Yes, we, we have. Um, I think that uh, in the, in the uh, 1980s, that, that machine I showed you that I cut my teeth on, the, the sm smaller of the big rings, yeah, that's called the superproton synchrotron. Uh, and the good, the good thing w with colliding matter with antimatter is you only, need w you only need one ring because the antimatter going in the opposite direction gets bent in the opposite way. So we were able to convert that old machine into a collider of matter and antimatter. And, uh, well, protons and antiprotons. Don't confuse it with matter and antimatter because anti antimatter is an antiproton with an anti-electron going around it to make anti-hydrogen, for instance. So, yes, we, di we did that. The hard thing was making enough antimatter. And we had to develop a, a method of accumulating antimatter over, over, over antiprotons over, over days and weeks before we put it into the machine and brought them into collision. And that won the Nobel Prize in 1984 and discovered the W and Z particles that, uh, uh, that Tara mentioned as t two of the force particles. I, I believe that Fermilab can now contain antiprotons. I heard that anyway. Um, so do you have any plans to do that with the LHC? No, I, I think, well, Tara works on in, in Fermilab on, on the experiment. This is, this is a continuation of the, LA, of the SPS, okay? And this is, this is the way, this is the way uh, particle physics goes. Once, once, a, uh, once a, a more powerful machine comes online, then the, 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 the old one is almost obsolete. And that's what happened with the superproton synchrotron. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we pushed it as far as we could, and then when the Tevatron came on, we, we, we stopped it. And the, that's what's going to happen now with the LHC. But in the LHC, uh, we have chosen, we, of course, we looked at the colliding uh, protons and antiprotons uh, because we would only need one ring, not two. But uh, the, the, the luminosity, the rate of events that you can get is far, far inferior to what we need. And therefore, we, protons are copious. They come out of a hydrogen bottle. They're very easy to produce. So two rings that was the only way. And if I could just add, in fact, it turns out that the, the physics that you can do in, um, at such high energies with the LHC isn't actually very different if you collide a proton and a proton as a proton and an antiproton. And that's because a proton isn't a fundamental particle. It's got three quarks inside it, and holding those together is this whole quantum world of stuff popping in and out of existence, including antimatter. So when we 
collide protons together, what is actually annihilating together is, the is two particular constituents of those protons. And we have the anti-versions there as well as the matter version. So we're fine. Right, we're going to take a, a question from the, um, the chat room. Uh, the Manchester Younger Members are uh, asking about um, what, what happens if we find a black hole. In the, I guess the, it's the normal engineering question, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> the worst that could happen? <laughs> well, there has been actually a risk assessment carried out by CERN about black hole production. Believe it or not, although this is a somewhat esoteric theory, it, it, it is a theory nonetheless and it has to be taken seriously. So, the eminent theorists from all over the world have worked together on this particular problem. And what they've determined is that for the amount of energy that we have available at the LHC, and this is really what limits everything, they've been able to say, well, if we can produce a black hole through the mechanism of this theory, then unfortunately, well, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, it will be so small, it will just collapse instantaneously. It, it's not large enough to be self-sustaining and have gravitational attraction and suck anything towards it. So there is no danger from black holes, and in fact, we may not even notice if they're produced. And the valuable cross-check for that is something that you alluded to in your question, first of all, which is our drop-dead argument from cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are, are particles from outer space that can be very energetic. And the energy at which they collide with the Earth can be more energetic than anything we're able to make in the LHC. So if we can make a black hole with LHC energies, we should also see black holes being produced when cosmic rays hit ordinary matter, because we have at least that energy and more. So either that happens, black holes are being produced, but we're completely oblivious to them. We never notice them because they disappear immediately. Or else the theory's wrong and it doesn't happen. Uh, the gentleman here, please. Could you, sorry, could you push the, the button on the microphone, please? Again. Um, John Schofield, plasma physicist, um, retired. Um, have you any predictions or theories on this imbalance between the matter and antimatter at the Big Bang? Well, we have ideas as to what might make it arise, and one of the ideas is something just very simple that we think that matter and antimatter have very slight differences in their behavior. It, it's the best reason we can come up with, and we've tested this in our experiments. We found that there is indeed a difference in the behavior of matter and antimatter. However, the difference that we've observed is only sufficient to explain about one galaxy's worth of antimatter and not half a universe, so there's clearly more to it than that. So we think that possibly the answer might lie in new phenomena that we haven't discovered yet that may increase the difference between matter and antimatter. But really, we don't know. That, that's why it's one of our great mysteries. So we've got time for a few more questions. There's a gentleman at the front here. Oh, I'm an engineer as well, so this may be a bit of a idiot's guide question here. Um, you're talking about at the very early times in the Big Bang. You're talking about nanoseconds. Um, what's the frame of reference? Because obviously, when you're talking about these huge energies and huge forces, a second isn't what we imagine it to be, or is it? Because obviously, do you understand my question? The frame of reference that you're saying, this is one second. Well, we, we always assume it in terms of the frame of reference from, well, we, we do assume a frame of reference, and you can count a second. Regardless of the expansion that goes on in the universe, there, there is a clock by which it ages. Now, if you prefer a better scale that has less ambiguity, perhaps, so than observers moving at the, near the speed of light where their clocks might be slightly different, you can actually look at the temperatures and map out the temperatures. And that's what Lin showed you in, in his plot of the history of the universe. And there we can really quite precisely map what we can recreate in the particle accelerator to a temperature, which tells us, and we can map that to a status of the universe at a particular time that we can explore. And we're not so concerned with the times we get back to. We're, we're concerned with just delving back into the universe as far as we can go, basically. So it's not the be-all and end-all to know that we're a nanosecond, a millionth of a second, a billionth, a trillionth of a second. It's to know what the universe is doing at those very small scales, which is the important thing. Okay, the gentleman three rows back. 
got two engineering questions. One, Lynn mentioned the ultra-high vacuum in the, in the vacuum pipe. I wondered what the pressure was and what sort of pumps are necessary to achieve that <coughs> vacuum. And secondly, um, if you've got two beams of 7 TeV hitting in the centre of mass frame, what would the energy be for a single beam hitting a stationary target in the lab frame? Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, the ultra-high vacuum, uh, it's, it's actually imme immeasurably low. We have, dif we have difficulty with the, with, with the gauges we have because in the cold machine, uh, the, the vacuum pipe is at 1.9 Kelvin, so it's a perfect cryo pump. Any re residual gas just, just uh, sits on the surface. Now, there are regions of the machine that are not cold, like in the regions of the detectors, about five kilometers, where, where we do not get the advantage of cryo pumping. And for that, we have, and it's, 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 an, it's a spin off from what we've done. We, we've developed um, a non evaporable getter. So we, we have developed a material which is. In the beam pipe, the beam, uh, the, of course, the beam pipe is long and lo long and, and small diameter, so this is very bad for pumping, as you, as you know. Uh, but what we've what we've done is we've developed this this getter material, which we evaporate on the inside of the beam pipe, and then activating it at a, a 200 degrees centigrade, which is a normal breakout temperature for an ultra high vacuum chamber. The getter activates, and it acts as the pipe acts as its own vacuum pump. And this produces the extremely low temperatures. And there will be a lots of applications of this in the world of particle accelerators and certainly outside in the future. Now, the other, the other question I... I if, 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 and if you spend TV it, 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 it will be a, a couple of, I mean, I, we have to do this. I, I, don't, I, I don't have it for 40. What, I, I've got it. I, I know the 400 GeV SPS, its central mass energy is 30 GeV. So this is what you lose from 400 to 30. Now, from 14 TeV, you, you, you're going to be a couple of hundred GeV only. The, the amplification factor is enormous by having the colliding beams rather than this knock-on effect of a stationary target. It's because you, you lose so much energy and that when you have a, um, a stationary target and a beam, then by conservation of energy, a lot of the energy is expended in taking what's produced in the same direction. And then it's not available to you as collision energy. Okay, we're going to take another question from the chat room. Okay, uh, two very quick questions here. Um, when, after the September restart date, do you expect to see some significant results that you'll be able to report? And... Um, is it going to be able to help you investigate string theory? Oh, right. Well, so as to how long it's going to be before we come up with results, well, it depends how long it takes us to understand the performance of our experiments, first of all, because the first thing we, we have to do when we get beam is to make sure that we understand the response of all the detectors that we've made, so we're not seeing spurious signals. And... We're going to do that as fast as we can, but that's going to take a few months to sort out properly. And then in terms of discoveries, well, unless there's something very unexpected and very obvious in the data, my own personal feeling is that it's going to take us a year or two to, to be sure that we, we found something and it's new. And then there's a whole new question of exactly what it is and how you identify it as well. So don't expect results to come out on the day this is turned on. This is a really long, complex effort with thousands of people trying to make sense of it. But we hope very much it's going to be, if there's anything there, we'll be able to have an inkling within the first few years anyway. What was the second question? String theory. Oh, string theory. Um, oh, that's a nightmare. So, <laughs> so there, there is, um, string theory doesn't really give you experimental predictions, but there are some quite esoteric versions that have that invoke the extra dimensions of space that string theory needs, some 11 dimensions altogether, and has them spaced by large amounts. And this particular class of predictions does give rise to an effect that we would see experimentally inside the Large Hadron Collider. So there is a chance that if that theory is correct that we would see it. However, it is an esoteric class of a theory that we haven't generally been able to test before. <laughs> right, I'm afraid we've probably got a chance for two questions, so I'm going to go for the gentleman at the back there. Hi there, Paul Brandon. Uh, very interesting presentation, Tara. Just as a, an observer, um, I think 
I got it right when you were talking that you were very keen to find this Higgs particle, which you can't see. Um, but I think I'm also right in understanding that you can't see the other 12 fundamental part particles that you mentioned. And I'm just wondering why it's so important to look for the Higgs one and not one of the other 12 that you can't see either. Well, you're, you're quite right that we can't see any of them directly. I mean, you, you can't pluck them out and hold them in your hand and see them. But we can see the effects of the particles that I was talking about. So we can identify them by looking at their behavior. And in fact, in some of them, we can actually detect by themselves. And they have signatures in our experiment that are absolutely characteristic, like an electron, for example. An electron is very easy to see in your experiment because you know its, it's typical ionization pattern you know how it curves in the magnetic field and what its behavior is and how much it radiates. So we, the key is we've been able to see evidence of all those particles, consistent evidence over many, many such particles that give us confidence that we've actually seen something unique in its own right. Now, the problem with the Higgs particle is that although we have an idea of its behavior from our theory, we've never seen any evidence of that behavior in action in our data, no evidence at all. So it's a quite, quite different class of object. Its importance is that our current theory and understanding of the universe relies on its existence. That's why it's so important. So if we don't see it, then it could be that our whole theoretical framework for the universe is completely not right at all, that we've got hold of the wrong end of the stick, and there is, in fact, a different explanation for all the phenomena that we've seen in our experiments. So the Higgs particle, we've never seen. The other matter particles, force-carrying particles, we have seen their effects, and we're confident that we can quantify them. They do exist. And have, does that answer your question? Great. Right, I'm really sorry, because I know there's plenty of you wanting to ask questions, but there's a lady at the back of the room there. Final question, please. Um, you say there's masses of data. Um, is there the possibility they could open it up to other universities like they've done with identification of galaxies they've opened that up to the public obviously this is specialist but in order to sort of bring in um, the results and the identification is there the possibility that could be open to universities worldwide well we uh, we did in fact in in the design of the LHC we had to do a huge amount of computations of, of the magnetic field quality for instance of uh, tracking of, of, of tracking particles around the hypothetical machine uh, enormous amount of computations and we did we, we did exactly that we opened it up to the distributed computing of normal desktop computers the analysis of, uh, of data coming out, out of the detectors is far too sophisticated for that and we we'll rely on this this grid with a tiered system where somebody sitting in in the, in their university has got access to the data which is sitting somewhere where they don't no work or care where it is, but it's not a thing that you could use a, a, a general public computing for. But this, this idea of archiving data is something that we do think about, and it, it would be a really fruitful area for sort of school projects if we could present the data in a form that was sufficiently useful. So we, we are thinking about this, but we just, we just don't have anything available yet. Okay, I think we'll end it there for questions. Sorry if you didn't get a chance to ask one, but you may get a chance later on, so I'll mention a bit more about that in a second. But now I'd like to invite uh, Misha Stocklin from the Institute of Physics to propose a vote of thanks. Well, um, I'm very grateful uh, to be able to give the vote of thanks tonight uh, to our two speakers who I think you will all wholeheartedly agree, uh, treated us to a captivating, inspiring, and entertaining uh, tour of the LHC. Um, it's all the more impressive, given the tremendously vast scope of the subject and uh, comparatively little amount of time that we've had. Um, picking out only one thing, as Tara Shears has mentioned, the, uh, the data processing of uh, the, 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 the data that we, yeah, the data that we're going to get, in itself could easily fill an hour of lecture. Uh, many scientists could, you know, talk about their detailed experiments, um, even just, you know, barely scratching the surface. I certainly have uh, very fond memories of uh, three-hour relativistic quantum mechanic blocks as a, an undergraduate that we had to go through. Um, it is, of course, the scale of the achievements uh, which make the LHC such a fascinating project, a collaboration between scientists and engineers 
from different professional and personal backgrounds. Uh, we saw in Lynn's section, you know, 20 member states, a lot of observer states, thousands of um, scientists around the world. And that's, you know, not counting people like civil engineers and so on. Um, coming together to produce outstanding results. In ancient and medieval times, uh, people built monuments, cathedrals, all sorts of landmarks for a variety of purposes. In many ways, uh, something like CERN is the modern equivalent of such feats by which our generations will be remembered in the future, hopefully. In fact, Tara um, conveniently had a picture of a cathedral there to compare to Atlas. That was unintended. She didn't, I didn't share my notes with her. Um, the purpose is to advance the knowledge and understanding of the world around us. As uh, Tara said at the end of the talk, we don't know yet what results will emerge. Um, quite possibly there may be a Higgs boson lurking around somewhere. Uh, Peter Higgs certainly would be very happy if that happened. Um, there might be some supersymmetric particles. There might be some completely unanticipated new class of particles around, which we don't know yet about, uh, or some other scientific insights. And it's not limited to interesting facts about the universe where, uh, you know, they'll be inspirational. Um, there's a number of practical, well, there's already a number of practical applications and technological advancements that have originated from CERN and the LHC. There was likely to be more in the future, um, if nothing else, as uh, Tara mentioned, the World Wide Web, the fact that uh, people were able to join us for tonight's lecture from around the UK and indeed the world. We had one member query from China, so and there's somebody watching us from there. Um, courtesy of something that had its origins at CERN about 20 years ago or so. I suspect that there's some of you um, who've been to CERN yourself, who may have seen this in person. Um, if you were there a few years ago, you would have seen some parts of the detectors while they were still above ground before they were lowered into the tunnel. I was there in 2007. Um, I got to see parts of the CMS experiment, um, which is the one that wasn't shown here, uh, the red one. If you know anything about CERN, there's a, a nice friendly rivalry between the Atlas and the, the, CERN, the, the Atlas and the CMS groups, the blues versus the reds. And we're not talking about football in this case. Um, when I stood there, that was a moment where I remembered why I'd chosen to study science, in my case, physics. It was very inspirational. This wasn't just, you know, advanced differential equations, part four. This was science and engineering at work. Um, there was a, uh, one bit of the detector, a metal covering plate, which had been signed by maybe 30 or 40 people who'd worked on this one specific part of one specific ring of one detector of one experiment at CERN. It's, but it's not just the sheer size of this, and we saw the comparison, you know, how big these things are. Um, it's the understanding of the technology and the research involved, even if it's just, you know, surface understanding, which makes it all the more fascinating. The interplay between, at one extreme, tiny microscopic quantum structures, uh, at the other extreme, you know, macroscopic engineering feats, and I think the speakers tonight, both of them, have succeeded very well in sharing with us both a part of this understanding and also their passion and the enthusiasm for their work with us. Um, it's entitled The Young Professionals Lecture. Um, part of the hope is for young scientists, engineers, even professionals in, in completely other areas of life, to enjoy the challenges of their work and to share their enthusiasm with fellow colleagues, friends, and those interested amongst the public. The LHC certainly has been very successful in providing outreach opportunities, generating interest amongst the public, amongst young people as well, despite the inherent difficulties of understanding exactly what's going on there. We know that not all that's at least externally said is always quite entirely accurate. Um, but if nothing else, uh, 20 years after the World Wide Web had its origins at CERN, we can now go to www.hasthelhcdestroyedtheearth.com <laughs> and we can get the very reassuring answer, no. <laughs> I think you'll agree with me that Lynn Evans and Tara Shears have given us an hour extremely well spent and I'd like, you to, ask, I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking them once again.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Misha. I'd just like to add my own thanks to, uh, to Lynn and Tara. Uh, superb talks this evening. Thank you very much. And just finally, I've got a, a gift for each of you to present on behalf of the IT to thank you for giving the uh, 2009 Young Professionals event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Right, nearly there, I promise. Okay, so um, this was a prestige lecture, and the next prestige lecture will be the President's Address on the 1st of October 2009, uh, given by uh, Professor C.M. Snowden. Everyone's uh, welcome to attend. You can find more details about that on the IET website. And then, uh, in about a year's time from now, will be the Young Professionals event 2010. So uh, it says at the bottom there, uh, get involved. I, I myself, I'm a member of the IET. I was part of organizing tonight's event amongst uh, many other people, too, too numerous to mention. So if you yourself are a member of the IET or thinking of becoming a member and you'd like to help organize this event next year, it won't be another LHC uh, lecture, not because we don't like it, but because there's, uh, there's plenty of other technological uh, topics to cover. So if, you, if you've got any interest in being involved with future uh, presentations, then please come and talk to me later on. So uh, just a few more things to say here. Um, you will be sent a feedback email, and we really appreciate it if you take the time to fill in your feedback on what you thought of tonight, and there's also an opportunity to suggest future events. There will be also be a, um, a drinks reception. Uh, I'm afraid we can't invite our colleagues who are joining us over the web there, but everyone who's here is, is welcome to, uh, at the end of the lecture, go up to the third floor to the Riverside Room. There's an excellent view of, of the Thames there, so I, I really advise you all to go up and at least take a look. And then, uh, and that's it actually. So I'd just, I'd just finally like to thank all the IT staff, both in front and behind the scenes who've made tonight a success. And thank you all for coming and have a safe journey home. Thank you very much. Is a measurement of the microwave spectrum all, all over the universe. Um, and that takes us back about 400,000 years and it's getting a, a lot of new information. And there, there was a rocket launch uh, a few days ago with the, with the, I think it's the Planck uh, satellite, to make a very fine measurement of the, the, the cosmic microwave background. So that takes us uh, to here. To really get back to the origin, of course, we've got to get these temperatures of 10 to the 16 degrees, or the tera electron volt, which we can do in our accelerators. And that bring, takes us back to about a trillionth of a second after the start of the Big Bang. And that is the regime that we are investigating with the LHC. Uh, I will say no more about that. Tara will tell you what we expect to find. Okay, so our tool to, uh, to, to, to do this, our time machine, is a particle ac accelerator. I think that uh, progress has always been made in understanding the uh, nature of matter by accelerating particles. Rutherford uh, discovered the, the atomic nucleus by bombarding a thin foil with alpha particles, which are made from natural from radioactive decay. But of course, to get up to a higher energy, then we have to do it by artificial means. Um, and we use particle accelerators, but very special ones. And just to explain you in, in, in very simply how a particle accelerator works, uh, or at least how a synchrotron works, there, 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 are, there are different kinds, but we use synchrotrons, and this is a cartoon of a of, of particle accelerator. Uh, first of all, the part, it, was, it was cited in Geneva because uh, Geneva was neutral and it was cheap, and it's still neutral. <laughs> so I, I think that now uh, CERN has, has grown to be the, the premier laboratory in the world. Uh, this is a map showing the the users of CERN, so the people who come to CERN to do their experiments. Of course, we've got the CERN member states in blue, uh, now 20 member states, uh, and, and there are more in, 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 in uh, <laughs> there, there are more put in application to join. 
And uh, then you see, basically, apart from this huge hole, which is Africa, you see the whole world. Um, the ones in green have got the special status of observers, uh, and the ones in red are users, uh, and there is a whole United Nations there, and I, I think it is incredible how it works. Okay, now, what, what are we doing? I mean, what is the fundamental um, problem? So, basically, I, it's, it's Einstein's equation. I think you know the equivalence of mass and energy. Mass and energy are interchange, interchangeable. E equals mc squared. If you want to make a heavy object, you need a lot of energy. Now, looking at the scales of, uh, of energy the, or mass, and we, we will be talking in the same way. We, we're never talking grams. We're talking electron volts when, when, when we're talking about the mass of something. Or from the Big Bang, pretty accurately, we are sitting here. Uh, and we know that the temperature, at least the temperature of the outer space, is 3 degrees Kelvin. A little bit less. But certainly warmer than the LHC is, I can tell you. Now, um, going back in time towards the beginning of the universe, I think you can, do, you can go back in time in various ways. Uh, one way is with astronomical telescopes. And with the beautiful uh, results coming out of the Hubble, for instance, you can go back to see the formation of the very young galaxy formation, which is about a, a billion years ago, 1,000 million years ago. This is as far back as we can go in time by visual observation of the galaxies. We can go back further than that by uh, in, in uh, measuring the, the, what's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. Up until about 400,000 years, around here, the universe was so hot that it was, it was a plasma, and a plasma uh, traps light. You can't see the center of the sun because the light is trapped by it. And at about 400,000 years, then the temperature got low enough that the electrons and the protons in the plasma combined to form hydrogen atoms, and the universe became transparent, and it let the light out. That light has been traveling uh, in the expanding universe. It was, it was very high energy initially, but the expansion of the universe has ex expanded its wavelength until you now find it in the microwave regime. And the cosmic microwave background is... <laughs> well, I, I think it's a pleasure to be uh, talking to you in this beautiful lecture theater. I think it is the, one of the nicest lecture theaters I've ever spoken in. It obviously shows that the engineers are much richer than physicists. <laughs> so um, so the, the, the topic is back to the Big Bang, Large Hadron Collider. Uh, I'm, good, I'm going to try to explain to you how we get back to the Big Bang, and Tara will explain to you what we expect to find when we get there. Of course, the, uh, <clears throat> you, if you were not on another planet in the last year, you, you must have heard about the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, which is a giant particle accelerator uh, on the outskirts of Geneva, and this is an outline of it. If, uh, you can actually see nothing from the air, but uh, the uh, LSC itself is in a tunnel 27 kilometers in circumference, um, uh, roughly 100 meters deep, uh, and it is fed. This, this is the CERN site itself, and over the years, the CERN accelerators, uh, this is the original one, it's, nearly, it's more than 50 years old, uh, and this is the one that I kept my teeth on in the early 70s. The super proton synchrotron are all part of the injector chain now for the LHC. You can see the, at the airport runway of Geneva, a bit of the lake, and, and the city is, is very close, just here. So before I start, uh, just a word of introduction about CERN. Uh, CERN was founded in, in 1954, only nine years after the, uh, after the war. Uh, and of course, the purposes were to, to reunite scientific Europe, uh, at least in, in, in frontline physics. Uh, and also to provide facilities by pooling resources, facilities that no single nation could, um, could afford, more like giga electron volts. Uh, one electron volt is, is, is tiny uh, weight, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 36 kilograms. You know that heat is a form of energy as well. 
Uh, well, an electron vote is just accelerating elect an electron through one volt potential. Now, if you wanted to get that one electron volt by, heat, by heating, by using heat, then one electron volt is equivalent to 11,600 degrees centigrade. So now you can see where, where we are, are, si are situated in, in the scale of, of voltage. Um, I think cook, cooking, for instance, an oven, gas mark five, something like 200 degrees centigrade, you are breaking molecular bonds. So you're using millivolts. We are, are in the millivolt to the volt regime, whereas at CERN, we are interested in the tera electron volt regime. And that's equivalent to ten, the phenomenal temperature of 10 to the 16 degrees centigrade. Where would you find such temperatures? The temperature in the center of the sun is, is about 5 million degrees. Uh, 10 to the 16 degrees only happened at the very beginning of our universe. I think now that is there is overwhelming evidence that our universe started as a singularity called the Big Bang uh, and expanded and cooled as a function of time. And this is a, a cartoon on a very nonlinear scale of the expansion of the universe uh, in, in years. We know that the uh, universe is now 13.7 billion years old. 